So the door doesn't go together. It's two things of four. Now you're ready. <laughs> Did your mom ever warn you, you better watch out because what goes around comes around? Maybe it was because of how you were treating your younger brother or sister. One of these days, they're not going to be so weak and defenseless, she noted. They'll be as strong as you, and the tables are going to be turned. Well, with all due respect to mothers everywhere, from my experience, that rarely is the case. From what I've seen, True justice is hard to come by. What goes around just keeps going around and around and around and around. The powerful squash the weak. The rich keep getting richer. The poor keep getting poorer. It does seem like there's a chasm fixed between the two. It just seems to be how our world works. It's rare that you ever are actually see tables being turned. In light of the disclosure of up to two million false accounts being opened in the name of actual customers, whom did Wells Fargo fire? Not the people making seven and eight figure salaries, not the executive in charge of that unit who is allowed to retire in July and keep $124 million in bonuses, stop options, and restricted stuff. It was the low paid branch employees, those who have no recourse. The same old story the powerful crush the weak. When Hurricane Katrina was bearing down on the Gulf Coast, the evacuation clogged the interstates. Thousands of fleeing cars, SUVs, and RVs caused a frustrating grid light as everybody scrambled to get out of harm's way. The only people who didn't evac were those intractably obstinate types. Oh yeah, and all those folks who didn't have cars, SUVs, and RVs. The weakest and poorest the handicapped and infirm, those without bus fare, let alone flood insurance. They were the ones who lost the most, the ones who packed into overcrowded shelters without adequate food and water. Those with resources benefited from them. Those without paid, some with their very lives. Some people always get the short stick. If the tables ever do turn, it's the exception rather than the rule. In fact, the rule is so reliable, so ironclad, that many people have come to think that, that God is the one who has set it up this way. If someone has done well, accumulated a lot of riches, amassed fame and fortune, then apparently they have found favor with God. But if a person has fallen by the wayside, lost his job, found herself between a rock and a hard place, then, so the reasoning goes, he or she must have offended God, must have brought this divine wrath upon him or herself. It's that heretical prosperity gospel of Jake's and Robert's, Reverend Ike and Claude Osteen, among too many others. That was also the theology of Jesus, lover of money detractors, the Pharisees that day. I'm sure this parable of Jesus fell on them like a dang bombshell, smack on top of their head. There was a rich man. He ate steak and lobster every day, wore nice suits, Brooks Brothers pajamas and silk boxes. He drove a Maserati and lived in a giant house with multiple plasma HD TVs and more channels than you could ever possibly watch. He had three sets of dishes every day, fine china, and even a set just for Christmas. At the end of his driveway, 
there was this vagrant named Lazarus. His name means God has helped. But you can't tell it by looking at him. He's emaciated, dirty, tattered clothes, dark skin covered with open sores. Smells the high heaven. He sits at the end of the rich man's driveway hoping that that one day the rich man will take pity on him and bring him some table scraps. Leftovers that he'll never eat anyway. They'll only get stuck in the refrigerator until they grow fuzzy and gotta get thrown away. The amount the rich man spends on his family cell phone plan could buy Lazarus plenty of medicine for those sores. And what he pays for premium cable channels could could provide a warm meal a day for Lazarus. At the very least, would it kill him to wheel his garbage to the road for pick up a little early so Lazarus could rummage through it? But no, he doesn't. Instead, he refuses to even acknowledge Lazarus' presence as he drives by him out his driveway. You can't be responsible for these people. They don't work. They just lie around waiting for handouts as a disgrace. What they get is what they deserve. Or as we heard in the news this very week, if you're black and you haven't been successful in the last 50 years, it's your own fault. You've had every opportunity. It's been given to you. The only attention that is paid to Lazarus comes from stray dogs. Better than nothing. But they don't do anything to help his hunger. So far, the story is nothing spectacular. It is as one would expect. The rich man enjoying his riches, the poor man tormented by his hunger, his sores, his plight. Sorry, Mom, the tables don't get turned. What goes around keeps going around. There's nothing new. It happens every single day. Even Lazarus' death is no surprise. We don't know if it was starvation or infection or some ailment that finished him off, but it's no great surprise. He looked like a skeleton anyway. But then the story gets more interesting. We expect Lazarus him in the dead, but not the rich man. He's got great insurance, the best medical care money can buy, and a pricey membership at the gym. Yet he dies just like Lazarus. And for the first time, at the moment of their deaths, they are equals. But it only lasts a very short time. They don't remain equals very long. In a strange twist of fate, it turns out that mom was right. The tables are turned. In the afterlife, Lazarus gets carted off to live in comfort while the rich man is tormented in a flaming abyss. Now, you would think that would be enough to reform the rich man. You would think that agonizing flames would be enough to humble him at least a little bit. But with the same air of superiority he exhibited in his earthly life, he who never lifted a finger to help anyone else calls out, Father Abraham, please, please have mercy on me. Send little Lazarus to dip his finger into water and cool my tongue. It's hot as Hades down here. Father Abraham replies, sorry. If you will recall, during your lifetime, you lived in the lap of luxury and comfort, while Lazarus lived in squalor and misery. Now he's going to be comforted here with me, and you are going to agonize there. There's no one doing it now. A huge dis, a, a giant chasm separates us, and there's no coming and going between you and us. Well, the rich man isn't used to taking no for an answer. But he can tell that there's no persuading Father Abraham on that one. So perhaps, though he can 
He can have Lazarus run a different kind of errand. Well then, Father, I beg you, send little Lazarus back to my five brothers to warn them so that they don't follow in my footsteps. They have the scriptures, Moses and the prophets, Abraham says. Let them listen to them. Father Abraham, I know them too well. They're not going to do that. But if somebody comes back from the dead, oh, then, 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 then they will listen. If they're not going to listen to the scriptures, they aren't going to pay attention to somebody raised from the dead. That's it. End of story. The curtain closes and the rich man is up to his neck in torturous flames while Lazarus comfortably lounges with Father Abraham. Finally, Lazarus receives justice. What went around came around. Apparently, when Jesus is telling the story, the ending is different. The weak don't always get crushed. The poor don't always get the shaft. With Jesus, the tables actually do get turned. Which is a very different picture of God than the one you might naturally infer by observing the world as we know it. Just to look at it, you pretty much have to conclude that the rich are blessed by God and that the poor are cursed. But Jesus tells a different kind of story. In this story, Jesus says the poor are blessed and the hungry are filled while the rich are cursed. After all, they've already received their good stuff. Those whose bellies are full now better watch out because they will be hungry. All apparent evidence to the contrary, that is the kind of God we've got. Or more accurately, that's the kind of God who's got us. Our God just loves to take those who are on the bottom and put them on the top. It's like God enjoys humbling those who always come in first place by putting them dead last. Our God is a table turn. Now, whether this is good news or bad news, all depends on which side of the ditch you presently find yourself. Barbara Brown Taylor suggests that if we're looking for ourselves somewhere in this parable, we should be looking to the five brothers. Father Abraham refused to send anybody back from the dead to warn the brothers, but by telling this parable, Jesus has warned us, put us on notice. Like the brothers, we have the scriptures, Moses and the prophet. But we also have Jesus, who we all know did and does come back from the dead. All these things serve as reminders of God's coming kingdom as witness to a just God whose nature is to absolutely turn the tables on injustice, a God who extends no mercy to those who find themselves extending no mercy to anyone else. In truth, we are far better off than those brothers because we have more information than they ever did. The question is, what are we going to do with that information? Amen.